Good evening. Thank you for being here tonight, everyone. Um, my name is Lana Michaels, and I'm the Education and Programs Manager here at the Museum of Sonoma County. And we are excited for tonight's program. Uh, before we start, I want to acknowledge that the museum exists on the territorial traditional land of the Pomo people in Santa Rosa and the Coast Miwok people in Petaluma, past and present, and honor with gratitude the land itself and the people who have stewarded it throughout the generations. I also want to thank Lucia Momo and all of the artists for joining us for the program tonight. Collective Arising, the insistence of Black Bay Area artists will be on view at the museum through November 27th. So I strongly encourage you, if you have not yet, to come to the museum and check it out. We are open Wednesday through Sunday, 11 to 5 p.m. Also, please consider supporting the museum by making a tax deductible contribution today. If you can, you can visit us um, on our website, museumsc.org backslash donate and easily donate using a credit card at any point. Um, during tonight's program, if you have any questions, we have a lovely little um, chat function and a Q and A function here on the bottom that will go to all the panelists um, and moderators. And we will see your question and we can either answer it in the moment if it seems right or we could answer at the end when we have a Q&A time. Um, I want to welcome Lucia, co-curator for Collective Arising. Um, she is a curator and writer from Sacramento, currently based in Philadelphia, where she currently works at the Constance E. Clayton, as the Constance E. Clayton Curatorial Fellow at the Philadelphia Museum of Art. Momo served, uh, previously served as the Curatorial Associate for Prospect 5 yesterday, we said tomorrow, curatorial assistant at the UC Berkeley Art Museum and Pacific Film Archive and curatorial fellow at the New Orleans Museum of Art. Um, she holds an MA in art history from Tulane University and a BA in art history in French from the University of Oregon. French, I did not know that, Lucia. <laughs> um, so I'd like to thank her uh, and all of the artists for joining tonight and pass her the baton. Cool, that, that explains a few things now. Um, <laughs> good night or good, good, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you to everyone at the Museum of Sonoma County. Thank you, Lana and Jack for being here tonight and supporting this event. And thank you um, to everyone in attendance uh, and especially our panelists, Jamal, Taylor and Lucasa. I am honored to be in conversation with them tonight. Um, just a quick, uh, I guess the basics for me, uh, I'm Lucia Lubumi. I uh, am currently in Philadelphia, which was originally Lenape land. Uh, pronouns are she or they. Um, and I am excited to help moderate this conversation tonight. We're just gonna talk a little bit about um, what it means to be in community, what it means to uh, come out of community uh, and what it means to, to gather. Um, as well as many other things. Uh, I will introduce our panelists real quick, and then we're gonna uh, look at some work in the exhibition before talking to each panelist about their, their own work and their own projects. Um, so first we have Taylor Brandon, uh, who is an artist and writer from Oakland, whose practice is grounded in the study of Black geographies, Black American cultural lineages, her family, and her experience as a Black queer woman. Her practice is defined by her own intuition, movement, archival work, and experimentation through video and writing. Taylor uses interiority, chemistry, movement, and mundaneness as her, of her own body as a starting point and model to understand herself and the world around her. And Taylor's creative practice is preceded by a five-year public relations career in entertainment, art, and education. She is also a founding member of the No Neutral Alliance, also NNA, a group of working artists and arts administrators who are fighting to dismantle anti-Blackness within arts institutions while simultaneously creating meaningful spaces outside the institution. Uh, Taylor's work has been published in uh, Selvage Magazine, SF Eater, Vanity Fair, and Abstractions Magazine. I'd like to add that it's actually through No Neutral Alliance that I um, met Taylor and sort of through No Neutral Alliance and through Instagram, because um, I was really excited and proud uh, to see what was happening 
um, in 2020 when uh, Taylor bravely took on SF MoMA. Um, well, I was working on my own stuff uh, uh, across the Bay in Berkeley um, and you were a wonderful emotional support um, as well as a great, you offered a great amount of solidarity as I went through my own struggles and I hope, hope I was able to offer some of that to you while you went through um, what we'll talk about later tonight. Um, so thank you so much, Taylor, for being here today. Um, then we also have Jamal Batts, PhD. Uh, Jamal is a writer, curator, and scholar. His work considers the relations between Black contemporary art, sexuality, and risk. Recently, he curated the 2022 University of Pennsylvania MFA thesis exhibition, Imperative of Struggle, which was a really beautiful exhibition here uh, that I got to see in Philadelphia. Um, he is currently at Stanford University's ideal, uh, he's currently a Stanford University ideal uh, provo provocial fellow, I hope I said that right, um, in the Department of Art and Art History. Bats is a member of the Curatorial Collective, The Black Aesthetic. Um, I've been very honored to get to know Jamal over the last almost year um, since I, I moved to Philly uh, shortly after Jamal moved to Philly. Um, and it's been really wonderful to have, uh, have you in, in community in this space, even though you're not right now, um, you're on the West Coast at the moment, but you know, you'll be back at Swarthmore um, sometime soon in the next year. Um, and then last, but certainly not least, we have Lucasa Branfman Verissimo, uh, who is a collective arising artist uh, in, in the exhibition. Um, so uh, Lucasa is an artist, activist, educator, storyteller, and curator who lives and works between um, Lisanne, uh, I own land, Oakland, California, uh, Ohlone land, sorry, uh, don't know why I said I own, that's a small town, um, and Pohata land in Richmond, Virginia, with roots in storytelling. Their work is informed by a commitment to craft and community, engagement with society, an interest in preserving and broadcasting uh, by Q, by Q, T, uh, I'm sorry, I've never actually seen that acronym before. By, it's P-I-Q-T-P-O-C stories. Um, their work has been included in exhibitions at September Gallery in New York, e uh, EFA Project Space also in New York, Leslie Loa Museum in New York, the Yerba Buena Arts Center in San Francisco, and uh, the Berkeley Art Museum and Pacific Film Archive, Archive in Berkeley, among others. Um, and I'm really excited to be talking to LaCasa today, and I apologize for stumbling through that, um, because we are going to get a dive into uh, their work for Collective Arising, which is a beautiful framework for our conversation here uh, called Rituals Here. So I'm going to just open PowerPoint and LaCasa, feel free to jump on. Um, doo -doo 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 -doo. And I'll click. Isn't there just a little, there we go. Okay. Um, so the image we have before us is an interior shot of Rituals Here, which is one of three works that Lucasa produced for Collective Arising. Um, Rituals Here had been produced before in Virginia as part of your, uh, your thesis show at VCU. Is that correct? Um, mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. Um, and a lot of it was informed by a lot of your work uh, in the exhibition and for Rituals Here was informed by a set of words that I'm, I'm sharing on the screen. And I'd love for you to, um, to tell us a little bit about how these words uh, influenced your work. Um, yeah. Yeah, um, thank you so much for gathering us today. Um, like Lucia said, my name is Lucasa Bramfman Verissimo. Um, I use they, them, and my name as a pronoun. Um, I'm zooming in from Powhatan land, which is also known as Richmond, Virginia. Um, and I was just thinking about be before this talk started about um, how gathering and dispersal are in the names, the name of this event tonight. Um, and I think so much of this list or this like index of um, ritual here research is so much about gathering and dispersal and so much of the work of No Neutral Alliance and Black Aesthetic is also that like 
put put those on this list because so much of this work that we are doing in kind of like collective practice um, is all about like yeah how, what what is the work that we do when we come together and what does it mean to have this work um, feed us um, and also how does this work go home with us and go in our different lives and our many communities and and spaces. Um, so yeah, this list, these two lists, um, I think of as that, I think of them as um, kind of all these different ways of um, collective um, connective tissue work um, that I think we must and we do practice um, for um, Black survival and for this um, collective resilience work. Um, and I'm really interested in kind of playing around with um, both conceptual definitions of collectivity and also these like a little bit more like um, like formal like patterns. Um, like I love thinking about um, like compost as this um, <clears throat> tool and um, form and material of our practices, like side by side um, friendship, um, that all of it is kind of like, you know, our work is composting and breaking down so that it can support future iterations of each other's practices. So um, yeah, I'm, I'm interested in that, in that weaving and, and that's what um, this list is all about. Awesome, I really love that. I, I'm I mean, I'm sure like a lot of people in the last couple of years have been fascinated by like uh, by mushrooms and my CA and like the the role that fungi play in like um, breaking down our our environment and the, also the connectivity of mushrooms that you have like the largest uh, living organism is a mushroom in the Pacific Northwest that's covering a, a vast amount of forest. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I love thinking kind of about us as mushrooms as well as like these connective, um, mm -hmm. connected beings, um, mm -hmm. kind of the spiritual element of connectivity, linking to, um, to the, our ancestry as mushrooms in a way. Um, so I love that you're bringing in compost and breaking <laughs> down as being like part of the cycle as well as part of community. Um, but yeah, uh, I also really love uh, utopia um, as something that can kind of be brought into this conversation as something that's fleeting to not necessarily an ultimate arrival, but as these like these I, I often feel utopic in when I'm in community with people I feel utopia mm. when I, I have if I'm, I'm in a large community and just feel connected um, mm. and often those those moments are are fleeting um but it doesn't make them any less special um, yeah and the, the utopia as the as the practice as not just this like future thing that exists somewhere out there in the ether but like all of our work being this like futurity work um yeah um it's been fun to kind of like craft this list and keep adding to it um and really think about, um, yeah, what does it what does it look like to organize? Um, what does it look like to to bring people together and um, break down systems? Like, you know, what is what what are all the all the names and other formats and ways that um, we are breaking down and fighting and doing underground work that no one sees but we feel definitely and I. On a quick side note, just to everyone in the audience, um, again, thanks for being here and feel free to use the chat function at any moment. Um, this is not like a, you are a part of the conversation as well. Um, I want this to be a very fluid and open space for everyone to uh, feel comfortable jumping in if anything that we say um, just feels lovely or if you have any questions, feel free to, to pop in the chat. Um, and then I also wanted to bring up so this is uh, rituals here, the work that Lucasa created for uh, Collective Arising that had been, this is it in, in its original iteration in Virginia, I'm in Richmond, Virginia. Um, 
And here's kind of the outside. Um, here's a good look at the interior. Um, when you had the show in Virginia, uh, you use the space a lot that you can see in this image, which uh, we, this is kind of like a virtual activation of the space, I'll say for tonight um, in Sonoma County. And unfortunately we didn't get around to uh, having an actual event in, in, in the space during the run of this exhibition. Um, but I really loved these images of, uh, these images of how they can be used uh, to make posters or, or artwork. Um, and feel free to- Yeah, it was also, yeah, used as like a, a gathering space and um, workshops happened inside the space and virtually inside. And um, I think about like, you know, so much, so much of our work is also about like hosting and giving each other spaces. And um, like I used to run a gallery in my home in Oakland and we hosted Black Aesthetic there at one point and like all the different like layers that our practices host have hosted each other and continue to host each other. And so, um, yeah, it was also important that this space could be like available and um, yeah, people came and gathered and um, did their thing in here. Um, yeah. Here's just a little little snippet of, of people gathering and connecting in the space. Um, yeah, and I'd love you for you to talk a little bit about the, your Nook Gallery, um, the which I feel like is in many ways rituals here kind of as a continuation of that work. Um, but would you like to let the audience know a bit more? That was what you were just talking about. Sure, yeah. yeah. Um, so um, starting in 2015, from 2015 to 2020, um, I hosted and opened up my uh, apartment um, in Oakland to the public um, in the form of kind of like a gallery project space. Um, that primarily took place in a built-in kitchen nook in my kitchen, hence the name Nook Gallery. Um, and it was, yeah, all sorts of programming went on, lectures, performances in the backyard, shows um, curated by myself and guest curators, and um, was really thinking about how do we like intentionally share our spaces and how do we think of like these spaces that we share as not only needing to like fit the look of what a gallery can be, but um, inviting folks to gather and, and talk about and look at art in the same place that I gathered and hosted friends over a meal and really thinking about the like the nourishment of um, what our, our home spaces can hold for um, other purposes too. Um, and um, yeah, lots of different activations went on there. And um, yeah, this kind of feels like a next iteration in a way, but maybe that's just my way of like creating spaces wherever I go. But um, yeah. Awesome. Yeah, it's a uh... I really, what I love about the both the Nook and Rituals here is that it's, uh, you're creating these spaces that are also just very un, unpretentious and very open to have like what are, what can be in different settings, very like intellectualized conversations, very um, conceptual conversations, but it, it, you're creating these very tangible, very comfortable spaces um, in which real conversations can be had and then you know real action can be taken um even mm -hmm. if it's just you know purchasing not just but even if it is you know purchasing and supporting an artist by purchasing the work of art in the nook um or by uh being there physically for people i, I think in especially post-covid physically being for people it, it has it has a lot <clears throat> excuse me can mean a, a whole lot mm -hmm. Um, yeah, work was usually not for sale at the Nook Gallery, but um, yes, other forms of exchange were were had there. Um, and yeah, I, I I I always just think about you know like yeah the the table in which we like 
cook each other food is also the table that we like organize around and that we strategize on and um, as also a space for showing and talking about new work or work that's about to bloom. So um, yeah, I just like throw it all in this, the soup of our, of our work. Awesome. Yeah, and this is very, could you talk a little bit about what the, um, what we're looking at on the screen? Um, is, it feels yeah. very as well. <laughs> yeah, so um, I think we're going to talk about maybe in the next slide what was painted onto the fabric, but um, okay. one of the last activations that was in the space um, was by a fellow um, master's student um, who was getting their degree in textiles, and this was a like woven net, it was a net making workshop. Um, and because we were in the round, it kind of automatically became a web, which was so perfect. Um, so these are, these are some images of, um, that workshop and, um, kind of like the, the painted lines, uh, representation of these, um, concepts that we saw on the first list are kind of like floating off into the, into the net web that is being taught how to make. Yeah. Awesome. With that, I'll move to the next slide. Actually, let's see. This is a good, a good slide for that um, to talk about the the webbing design. I wish I had a good photo of the um, the mural that you painted as well, because the design oh, kind of yeah. continues into the space. Um, and maybe during the discussion, I, I can pull up the the little uh, three sixty tour and show people that. Oh, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So. Um... Yeah, these were kind of like trying to depict some of those patterns um, and and um, organizing structures that were on that original list that I showed. And um, I often work with text as a form of storytelling and really turn to kind of like pattern and organic formations as these other ways to like remind us of um, this, this web that we we nestle ourselves in or this sanctuary that we kind of create um, when we um, come together. Um, and so, yeah, they're kind of, on, on one hand there are, or one side there are, kind of looks a little bit more like, a, some people say it looks like a fence, which I was not the idea, but maybe. Um, I was thinking about it more as this kind of like patchwork quilt um, structure on the left that has uh, like diamonds, some of them that are covered in. Um, I mean, the whole the whole piece kind of feels like a patchwork quilt in a way, um, but um, that's what that side was. I, yeah, also just, um, yeah, love love when lines intersect like simple intersections but all the way all the things that that can hold um and then on the right kind of getting like loose and interwoven and kind of like a a tangle um which i feel like a lot of this work is a tangle um and um so much undoing but also not wanting to undo too much because the the tangle and the web is where we live um, and so, yeah, that's a little bit about what's painted on um, a lot of the, all the fabric was found or thrifted um, and then painted on with uh, bright colors um, to kind of, yeah, just be fully present. Awesome. Um, and I see we have a question, which um, we can get to in just a second. Um, so I think it's a good question to ask while, um, Luke, so while you're on here as well. Um, and just, uh, I just wanted to add my own thoughts, which are that the, um, the design that's drawn or painted onto the interior of the space and as well, um, which you can't see in this photo, unfortunately, onto the, um, the wall, the glass, uh, wall next to it, which is a kind of like a, a garage door that has glass paneling in it. Um, the, what they really evoked for me were the more hatched pattern that was like fence-like for some people reminds me a lot of DNA and something that's like very tangible and, and the connections that we have and very real connections we have in space, whereas the more, the fluid, uh, connections that are drawn, the way that it's 
drawn on the, or painted, sorry, I keep saying drawn, onto the, um, the garage door. Oh, thank you, Jack. Um, you can kind of see in, I'll, I mean, I'll unshare my screen for a second so you can see that. Um, but uh, it, that evoked for me more ancestral lineages that are, are the reasons why we were able to, to protest and continue to do the work that we're meant to do. Um, and to kind of link to within um, uh, within my own spirituality, like the idea that our ancestors are always in us, that our ans we are an embodiment of our ancestors. Um, they're always connected to us. So the tangible and the intangible constantly being linked and, and interweaving um, really spoke to me in, in the designs that you you created for this. Um, and that you replicate it on the the wall that, that Jack is sharing with us. Um, so yeah, and I, with that kind of in mind, thinking of uh, uh, of working in the space as well, um, I just want to share. Um, I'm going to read out the question we have from um, from Aja. I, I hope I'm saying that right. Um, which uh, Aja uh, Aja says, uh, I'm a black uh, queer, born and raised in. Uh, I'm Black, queer, and born and raised in Santa Rosa, Sonoma County. Um, I left at 18 at what felt like my own uh, necessary act of fugitivity in a space that is so anti-Black with so little Black community. I've been so curious in what uh, feelings uh, like uncomfortable about the presence of recent Black artists, cultural offerings in uh, Sonoma County with the museum. Can anyone speak to that, or if you if you felt that with programming or just black gathering and dispersal in spaces like Sonoma County in general? I've been wondering if any black artists have been involved. Oh, thank you. I'm glad I got that right. Um, so I can um, I can speak a little bit to that, and um, Lucas, if you want to add, uh, I so I lived in Sonoma County for two years. Um, while, while I worked at UC Berkeley, I lived in Santa Rosa. Um, because it was more affordable than Berkeley. I mean, I had a partner who who got a job there, um, and and it what is it's it's an interesting space to exist as a black person because you're most definitely not the majority in the space. And it, it was weird going to work in the East Bay and then coming home to uh, to Santa Rosa. Um, to be like close to community and then to be kind of very isolated from community. Um, I, I've been involved with the museum, I think since like a couple months after I moved, um, the director had reached out to me and asked if I'd be interested in being on the exhibition committee. So that was maybe like 2019, uh, maybe 2018. Um, and uh, the impetus for this exhibition was the summer of 2020, which was uh, the following George Floyd's murder, same with Ahmaud Arbery and Breonna Taylor, all the, um, the violence that happened and the uprisings that happened. The museum kind of reached out to me and said, you know, we'd love to do kind of like a, a Black Lives Matter show um, immediately. And um, with the help of my co-curator, Shari Kundayo, we kind of came back with, let's have an, a show that features Black artists uh, who are in the Bay Area. And um, I was really inspired actually by Taylor's work with No Neutral Alliance uh, that was really up and running at that time um, and seeing the power of collective, uh, the power of collective voices um, when you have enough people behind um, just you know one individual experience or one individual instance of of racism within an institution to be able to hold the museum accountable at least publicly if not internally because that's a whole other mess um and that's where the idea for doing a show about artists who've been in collectives came from um i'll be honest you know it's uh it's interesting working in predominantly white spaces always as a black woman um and always, I think this is like the first exhibition the museum's ever done featuring all Black artists. Um, so there's a, you know, vocabulary that has to be learned and shared. There's um, uh, a lot of understanding that has to be um, developed uh, and a lot of trust that has to be earned. Um, and so, you know, sometimes things were rockier than others. 
Um, it is interesting being in Sonoma County. There are no Black artists from Sonoma County in the show. I'm the only link, really, because I lived there for, uh, I was there when the shows, we started talking about the show, but then I left. Um, and I'm, you know, not born and raised there, so I can't claim it as a, as representing a Black in Sonoma County. Um, we've worked with like the Black Forum in Sonoma County, which is mainly a group of uh, former teachers or current teachers in Sonoma County that are trying to um, make the, the Black presence in Sonoma County known, but also to serve the community as best as they possibly can um, by dealing with housing issues, mental health services, um, and education services that can be offered. Um, so they actually sponsored a free day when we first opened, which was really wonderful, um, as well as uh, 100 black, black Men. We worked with them as well um, to uh, work with, uh, or the, the director of the museum really has worked with them um, in, in conversations with this exhibition um, and their chapter in Sonoma County. So it's been it's been interesting as someone who left Sonoma County and felt that it was a very um, I wouldn't necessarily call it a white space. I call it a very brown space, actually, um, just because there, there's a large Latino population there, and I don't want to erase the population just because I, within, like, my neighborhood, there were a lot more white people in my neighborhood or with there on the museum, um, but there's a large Latino population there, um, and so I, I've heard from a lot of, like, board members and stuff saying, like, you know, it's a, it's a very white city, and I'm like, no, it's not. Um, so I just want to shout out to the, uh, the Latinx community in, in the Bay and Sonoma County, which we tried to work with as well. There's a, a collective, Raiz Collective, um, that I believe the museum will be working with, but we had hoped to do some kind of cross collaboration with them. Um, so long answer, uh, is that it's complicated, bumpy. Um, but ultimately, I'm really proud of the show, and I'm really glad that we're um, we have this space now in Sonoma County, where a lot of students have come out and said, "Wow, I've never seen black art in this community before," or "Like I've never seen black art in this museum space before," and to at least offer that for the past six months has been really um, meaningful, and we'll see where it goes from there. Um. I'd also like to share a little bit to that too, because I love this question so much, um, Asia, because I think your feelings of feeling uncomfortable are so valid in the way that I think we should be questioning the work of museums in general. And so I think that you having feelings of uncomfortableness, like growing up in this space, um, and knowing the community and having your own lived experience there and then being like, wait a minute, what is the motive behind this is so powerful and so important. And I think that that's a basis of a lot of my feelings about working with No Neutral Alliance and then also just questioning museums and cultural institutions all the way around um, because it is tricky and it is complicated because on one hand, you probably recognize like, oh, it's probably really great that there are like black artists who are being supported in these ways. But then in your brain, you're probably also like, wait, but what about these however many years that they weren't doing this work? <laughs> and like, what was going on there? And then to even get to this point in 2020, like it took this long to get here, like what happened? And to hear the fact that you felt like you had to leave for your own survival, I think is major. And I think like that's, is an important point like you should like you you know that uneasiness or that feeling and I think we should be looking at cultural institutions like that even questioning it down even if it is black people just because it's black people doesn't mean that it's you know like all the way sweet so I think that's a great question and thank you for sharing yeah and I also I also feel like you know what happens at this museum after the show comes down like does it go on for another whatever, how many years until there's another, like what is the what is the continued work? Because all of this doesn't stop when the show comes down. And um, I think, yeah, I, I feel like there are some like physical moves, like 
painting the walls black that was like, you know, felt like a big risky business for the museum and things like that, that they are like, okay, like, yes. <laughs> yes, these walls are black, but this space is not for us. Um, and so, um, yeah, I, I really wonder about this like continued work and um, I, I haven't spent, I hadn't attended the museum before the show. Um, so I'm not really familiar with the space, but um, from installing on site for about three days, I, I think I, I think I understand what's going on there. Um, so yeah, I, I really wonder that too. And I wonder like, yeah, what, what does the work look like? Um, even when, when this work is up, like, what is the museum doing even while this work is up? Um, and yeah, that these like conversations not end or not like be just held by like the work that's up there or the labor that these artists did for this work to be up there, that this is like, yeah, what is this? Let, like, let's let's check up. I mean, we, we, we do that with all of these spaces or, or whatever that looks like, but um, yeah, what is this continual work? Definitely. I know we can, um, I'll probably have more to talk to you about that as well, especially when we get to, to Taylor um, and talk more about like the No Neutral Alliance. Um, but yeah, just continuing to question museums are a byproduct of, of white supremacy in a lot of ways, the structure itself. Um, and so how do you how do you dismantle structures? Can you dismantle structures that were built upon or based upon white supremacy? I think is something that we should all be thinking um, and I, that I definitely think as I navigate a lot of predominantly white spaces in, in museum world. Um, but yes, I, I wanna also make sure we get to Jamal and Taylor. So I just wanna kind of review again these, these words um, and maybe as we've you know gone through this and had this uh, this discussion as well, if there's anything in particular that kind of jumps out to Lucasa. No, I feel like this is such a yeah. Let's let's pass it on. I um yeah. I I'm just thinking so much about this ecosystem that the three of us are in, and um, that you're into Lucia, and that you're. Um, and yeah, I'm excited to hear more about Black aesthetic through your, through your words. Um, and yeah, all, all, of, all of these words like feeding the rest of the conversation. So thanks for including my uh, handwritten list in this conversation. Of course. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, and Jamal, I'd love to um, have you, I know you have your own slides, so I'll stop sharing mine for now. We can always bring those back up. Um, would you like to, to speak about the Black aesthetic um, in your own yes. work as well? Yes, mm -hmm. certainly. I mean, I think I'm, I'm, I am I'm. kind of just want to bounce off a little bit of Taylor and Lucasa we're speaking to, because I think that what brought the Black aesthetic together and sustains us through our many iterations, the difficulty of collectivity, et cetera, is the fact that we felt so isolated and alienated from these art spaces that we were hoping were utopic. We were thinking of them as the alternative because of the Black work that was in those spaces that drew us there. And then white supremacy in the face immediately as you enter them and you're left thinking what to do and all you're left with is each other. So I think that is something that we're striving to hold on to as the Black aesthetic. So I'll just, I wanna get back into the conversation. I made a few slides just cause I wanna kind of hold up the collective genius of the those that I work with. Um, so I'll go through those quickly and then I'm hoping that we can get back to the conversation. Um, so I'm going to share my screen. Okay, so for some reason, okay, so this is the Black Aesthetic. Um, the current members are me, Jamal Batts, Ramalika Imhotep, Nan Kali Moore, and Layla Weefer. Um, we're a group, uh, we're a curatorial collective, we're a group of artists, visual artists, poets, um, folks who are interested in aesthetics, queer aesthetics, scholars, and 
um, yeah, we've come together um, out of this need. Um, and we, we started in 2016, um, thinking of ourselves as of doing kind of film programming and curating around film, thinking about film as a kind of uh, accessible form for conversation for Black creatives in a moment in the Bay Area where many of us were dealing with rising housing costs, gentrification, fewer spaces to show Black work. Um, and also just a, a general feeling of, of alienation in that in that moment. Um, there have been a number of iterations. Previous members have included Ryan Austin Dennis, Kristen Johnson, and Zoe Samudzi. Um, but this is the collective as it stands currently. Um, so recently, and let me see something, if I could do something real quick. Okay. Recently, we had a, a retreat and the goal was to come up with a new um, mission statement for the Black aesthetic. And what we came down to was the Black aesthetic is a curatorial collective that critically engages and experiments with a living and an evolving archive of Black visual culture. With Black film as a point of departure, we organize screenings, exhibitions, and publications. Through practices of study, resource sharing, and collaboration, we advance queer, liberatory, and accessible alternatives to the contemporary art landscape. So I think that all of the members um, have walked into spaces where we have felt um, violated, where we've had to deal with harmful behavior, et cetera. And we're looking forward to the Black aesthetic now um, in our new iteration and new form as an incubator for our own work and hopefully the work of other Black artists as they enter into these spaces so that we can provide support, so that we can resource share. Um, but also as a way so that when we enter these spaces, we're coming with our people um, and that we know we're supported. So um, some of the work that we've done, the four of us together, is the mo are the most recent um, publication of the Black Aesthetic season three um, called Black Interiors, which was based on a um, three screenings that we did with the Berkeley Art Museum and Pacific Film Archive, where they asked us to work with their archives. And we came up with programs that had to do with Black interiority um, around um, notions of sweat, thinking about Black labor, and these art markets um, and I'm thinking of a number of different themes around the, um, around the theme of, of Black interiors. And the cover here is by um, fab, um, fiber artist and photographer Andrew Wilson from Oakland, from the Bay Area. Um, and most recently, we worked with um, Oakland-based artist Sadie Barnett um, on a project called the New Eagle Creek Saloon, which is an installation she created as a dedication to her father's Black-owned gay bar in San Francisco. I think it was from 1990 to 1993. And we were invited by Sadie to um, do a film screening, and we added to that performances and readings about our own erotic experiences around the Bay Area. I think that for many of us, the Black aesthetic became a container for thinking about those kinds of erotic practices, experiences, et cetera, and writing in forms that we didn't think that, um, are, we knew that other venues wouldn't necessarily accept. Um, thinking about personal narrative, auto theory, critical dialogue, et cetera. So I think that that's what kind of, a, one of the things that excites us about the Black aesthetic. This has actually started as a project at the lab, um, an experimental performance space in Oakland uh, where we first did this work and then we did it again at the kitchen um, this year. Um, and this is just some photos of some of the films that we uh, showed at the Berkeley Art Museum and Pacific Film Archives. And um, Marvin K. White, uh, Black queer poet and preacher who we work with on that project. Okay, so I'm gonna stop sharing my screen now. Um, so that's some of about the Black and I'd love to talk more about what we're looking to do um, and what our plans are going forward, but I'll leave it there for now. Awesome. Um, let's see, and we can dive into that, but I also want to give Taylor a chance to talk a little bit about No Neutral Alliance and your work at the moment. Um, and so, yeah, I want to hand it off to Taylor. Hey, so excited to be here. Um, 
first when Lucasa was speaking about their work, I couldn't in the list that you wrote, I was thinking a lot about fascia and just like mm-hmm. body work. And Mm -hmm. the more you move your body, the more you have to tend to it and Mm -hmm. how getting into and kneading through your own body, um, Mm -hmm. it hurts and it's really painful, but it's super necessary for your longevity and health. And I think that's the same way that I've been thinking through community. Um, Mm -hmm. No Neutral Alliance, founded in 2020, I think the difference um, here, I think obviously it was still in a moment of feeling isolated within this white supremacist space, but also more so a very like uh, crisis. Like it was like crisis. It was, you know, embedded in crisis. It was um, us of MoMA censoring my words. And I think crisis work is really difficult. I think collective work is really difficult in general. Um, And difficult in the way of like, how do you possibly sustain this? And then I think in the case of No Neutral Alliance and for myself specifically, like how do I sustain something where the beginning of it was the center of my own experience? Um, And I wouldn't have been able to feel supported if it wasn't for all of the artist collectives who joined with me to form No Neutral Alliance. Um, And I think that it was just like a really challenging time for me in a lot of different ways. Um, But I'm just grateful to the community who sort of like swarmed around me and yeah. And I wanna say that thinking about Asia's question a little bit more, I think when it comes to museums and institutions, because I worked at SF MoMA, I had a very different understanding of how things are. And I think also because I worked in PR and communications, I had a very different understanding of how things are. And so I was very attuned to the different communications channels that were used to talk to different audiences. And mm-hmm. because I worked in PR, I very well understood like which audiences were tuned into their newsletter versus their Instagram versus here and there. And I think that the clever thing about large cultural institutions is that they have so many resources and they have so many different audiences and they bring in so many different people to help them understand their audiences. Like there's somebody coming from London every month to understand who these people are who are visiting this space. Um, And it gets really tricky and it gets really sinister and it gets really challenging and you sort of have to really rely on your community. And then within relying on your community, you're working through yourself and your own things. And then you're having conflict with people around you. And so I think that going back to that example of the fashion, working through stuff, it gets really hard and you feel anger and you feel rage and you feel so many different things. And I think that I'm a totally different person than that time there. Um, but learning how to sustain and stay within community has been like super instrumental. Um, Yes. And I also wanted to say, again, communications perspective. um, I think that my work with No Neutral Alliance has like really invigorated me to just think about like unions and collective work in general, especially with workers. And right now I work in service and it's something that I'm very much committed to because again, I think that's a way of keeping that fascia nice and flexible and malleable. Um, I'm a barista, so I'm seeing people every day. I'm interacting with people every day and I'm building these like these connective tissues slowly but surely. And I'm able to learn more about these people and and people around me in my community and who I am. Um, And I think that I was able to do that within the museum museum setting, but I was working in communications and I was far removed from the people who were visiting the space. And I was far removed from the ground. I was literally on like what the like seventh or eighth floor, like I was up. (laughs) And I think like, even when I think about museums, I think about how they're structured and how that structure in and of itself is conducive to sort of like the conditions that they were born from. But um, I just want to say shout out to all the like, surface surface service workers of museums and cultural institutions like the people who are on the ground the security guards 
the coat check people, the membership people, anybody who literally has to be on the ground and interface with the community every day in the museums because the cultural work is obviously important, like curation and all these other things are very important, but like the structure of the thing, I was not on the ground. And so now that I am in a role when I where I am on the ground and I am more observing, like that's where the real work is being done. And unfortunately, sometimes with a lot of like the organizing within museums, it gets difficult because of those different levels. So there are people who are um, part of the union. There are people who aren't part of the union. There's people who are on the ground who can't participate in certain things because they literally work on the ground and they're, they can't work from home. Their paycheck is contingent on them coming in. And so I think also in sort of like organizing within museum spaces, that is also super important. But I just want to say, I wish I had like a list of everybody's names who I worked with in No Neutral Alliance, but I'm just so forever grateful and forever indebted to everybody who's stepped in and swooped in and supported me and held me. And like, it's intergenerational work. There's so many Black women of all generations who came in from the Bay Area, who've worked in the arts, who worked at SFOMA 20 years ago, who worked with certain curators decades ago, who've gone through the very same things and the things that we've experienced aren't new. And so I think, again, this is also intergenerational. Back to that fascia, like we're all connected. Like the stuff that we're doing now is very much connected to what has been happening in that strong lineage. Um, and I'm just very proud to be a part of it. Um, so yeah. Thank you so much for sharing that, Taylor. Yeah. Um, and for, thank you all of you for being so um, so vulnerable tonight as well to talk about all everything. Um, it's a uh, like we're we're the reason that I find that we see communities because there there is a need for that. So and a lot of that has to do with being being harmed in in these spaces. Um, I know uh, I've been. A, Banff has come up a lot, and it's uh, I I don't know how it is with um, with SF MoMA, but sometimes every time I hear the the museum's name, I just flinch a little bit, just because it was a um, I mean I was the only black person when I left in the entire institution, and that uh, it really does something to uh, it says something about an institution when when there are that few black people uh, in in the East Bay working at an, an art center. Um, and also in talking to other people who I've met in community, just the the uh, the kind of violence that is enacted on Black artists whose work in particular is, want, is wanted to be consumed by a white art market, by white art museums that people want to collect and to, to show um, individuals uh, and their work but there isn't necessarily the undercurrent of care that I feel is what I, I seek in community, what I seek in collective spaces, um, and what often is like one of the first things that needs to happen is just uh, caring and uh, healing before you can kind of fight. Um, yeah, I'm like, can we can we bring our like care web, like our web of people with us when we're going to install? Like, you know, I'm like, what are our what are our uh, you know requirements for these spaces? a lot a lot of requirements but I think about that a lot too I'm like oh I need I need y'all there when we're yeah. when we go space together or yeah certainly um I think that that is something that we because we just had a, a a retreat like our first like retreat a residency like at respite in the round this like queer radical space in Rougemont, North Carolina. And it was like one of the things that I guess that I'm getting at is that there's that. And one of the things that I think Ramalaika brought up there that was really important and that sticks with me and that she brought up thinking, or they brought up thinking about Tony K. Bombara was um, the reminder that this is kind of slow work and that, 
it is work that if you move too fast, I think I'm thinking about also what Taylor was just saying about how things are so complicated and you have to think about, you have to sit with and think about your plan, your strategy before you're enacting these interventions. And I think that one of the things that's important about that is the reminder that collective work is difficult. And I think you and your people also need to be honest with each other about what you need and what you want um, and out of these institutions. And from being with each other, like that beautiful moment, that utopic moment of actually being with each other, um, you're brought together, but what is your mission? What do you want uh, to see in these spaces? Um, and to be honest about what you can and cannot give um, when doing that work. So I think that that's really important. I suggest individual therapy, <laughs> but also <laughs> I would I would also suggest like we like we've had a mediator come in. Like my mentor um, Melvin Escobar suggested, like you have a mediator. So there's somebody with the group too. So I think that that's something that I just want to I just wanted to say about how this is not a simple. Um, a process and that there is kind of internal collective work that needs to be done as well. Um, so, yeah. I feel like you talked about planning and strategy. And I feel like that is like the number one thing that I took away from working and organizing with No Neutral Alliance was the plan is the ultimate. Like people will try to throw curveballs at you. Things will come out of left field. But that work that you do with your team before and really getting to the root of what it is that you want. And when you form a plan around that, nothing can move it. Nothing can move it. It's unchangeable. So then it becomes really easy to make decisions. But it's because you took that like time to really get, get in there and then be like, this is our plan. Okay, so now when it's time to make a decision, we know that it either falls here or there. And I think that's really, really important. Mm. And then when we have the plan, all of the, all of all of the like support structures that we need for these for these plans to to happen or for these for us to be able to even be have enough energy to keep dreaming. Yeah, yeah. The support and resources I feel like are are can also be things that can really dismantle collectives. Is a lack of resources, a lack of support. Like, no, um, I know that uh, when I was in New Orleans, I was a part of a space called 912 Julia that was a gallery space, also collective space, and offered, like, mental health care to artists in the area. Um, but then when when Ida hit, there was just no recovering. Like, we, everything just kind of got dismantled, and um, and everyone kind of scattered as well physically uh, after after that happened. Um, and I'd, I'd love to talk a little bit because our the title is gathering and dispersal, um, kind of about uh, you know if you you have the if both the dispersal of collectives what happens when when it, you've either accomplished something or decided to move on, but also kind of the the fungibility the move the movability of collectives the how things can change um, if you if the core plan is realized or it's decided collectively that it needs to shift. Um, yeah, I don't want to bring too much in. But. Um, I feel like when it comes to no neutral alliance in the end of it, I mean, I can only speak for myself and this is true for like other collective members. And I don't think that it's like all the way finished, but like, we're not active, but the legacy is strong. Do you know what I mean? Like, I know for a fact that if anything were to pop off, like I now have a blueprint to work from that I can organize quickly. And you were talking earlier about ancestors. Like, I don't know what it was, but I moved in a way. I've never been that productive since that moment. Like I gave a lot in that moment and I've never, <laughs> I've not reached that <laughs> level since, which I think is okay. But I think towards the end of it too, there was this feeling of like, they are not worth our genius. Like the core of it was like, this space is not worth all the, like you saw what we just did in three weeks. 
okay, so imagine if we were doing this for something that we really loved and cared about. Like, yeah, we love Black people a lot, but this space, like this thing, white supremacy, like I can't dedicate my life to that, but I can surely dedicate my time and energy to uplifting Black people. And so I think that if we ever were to come back, I mean, we, you know what I mean? It's not dead. The legacy's still alive. You know what I mean? Snap my fingers. It's, it's done. But I just think that at a certain point, I was like, I don't really care no more. <laughs> like they've been playing. I'm tired, you know, got to move on. The message was sent. But I think what's really cool is that it's, it, I still like talking to people who work at the museum now, like black people will tell me like Taylor, like things have actually changed. <laughs> like you were really, like y'all's work, no neutral alliance. Like y'all were really able to shake some stuff up and make things happen because that work could not happen internally. Mm. Like a lot of the things, the, the change that's being sought cannot happen from the inside. You got to put pressure from the outside where you have no rules, where they can't fire you, where they can't tell you to be quiet, where they can't schedule you to have a meeting with your supervisor and then put you on the, um, what's it called? On the probationary tract, or you know how they be doing the disciplinary, you know what I mean? Like you need to be outside of the bounds. So yeah. <laughs> yeah, no neutral is forever. I'm like, even though we're not meeting, regularly it doesn't matter because that's the like compost work it's like that mm -hmm. fueled so much of this work that we're continuing to do I'm like mm -hmm. I met you from no neutral like yeah. like that's the gift that I get to live with mm -hmm. you know for for future projects like hell yeah I'm calling you for when I need a, the fire the fire <laughs> will come back Yeah, certainly. I mean, I think that, yeah, that I just wanted to to uh, reflect that that work is still happening. Like I went to a performance at like, what is it, Mocha in Los Angeles, and it ended with your saying, like, it was like, Taylor Brandon said museums kill people too. And it was like there in front of like all of these, like, it was like this performance that was like for Black queer folks, but like, the members had bought up the tickets there weren't that many black queer folks there but like that is like what they had to as they're leaving so it was kind of weird but it was also <laughs> like you know it was also like this beautiful thing where it was like this work that happened in in the bay area that was a response to the mess that was happening at, at happens and is happening at these at these institutions is still you know it's still percolating and that wasn't that long ago yeah Please send me more info about <laughs> We'll do, we'll do. Wait, remind me your, your collective question, Lucia, that you asked us before. My collective question. What was my collective question? You were asking about scattering. And one oh, of the things yes. that, yeah, oh. yeah, that's one thing that I was going to say, because Taylor, I mean, our last publication at the end, there's these statements toward conclusion, because we had mm -hmm. planned to sunset the Black aesthetic. Mm -hmm. Like we were going to, we were all going in different directions in the country. We didn't know where our like careers were taking us, where we needed to go to sustain ourselves, et cetera. And I think that there was just something about the work that that we did that we loved it too much to let it go so we decided to see if we could try our hand at it again and i think these digital platforms they have their limits they're you know all embedded with all types of messed up racial capitalism and you know elon musk and whatever however they have become this space where we've been able to organize and to think about what the next steps of the black aesthetic could look like and how we can actually honor the different um talents and desires that we have um and to use it as a place to bring more people into the kind of work of study that we do the um bring more people into thinking about ways that you can interrupt um an institution by maybe staying a bit mobile like staying outside of it and not like connecting yourself to the institution but also how to like get the resources that you need from these spaces that are continually telling you they have nothing when they when they have more than enough so i think that that is something that we're like that's what we're trying to experiment with now and think about how we how we can do that work mm. 
Yeah, I love I love that. Like always, I mean, always, wherever we are, we're like, what printer can we use to print the flyers? Like, who has the institutional access that will, you know, can order us some reams of paper? Um, bring that bring that van into the parade. Um, and yeah, when I was a part of No Neutral Alliance, um, I was a part of Control Shift Collective, which no longer exists, um, had to kind of sunset during the pandemic because of rising rent and artists not having jobs that could pay for that rising rent, unfortunately. Um, but I think a lot about um, so many of the folks that I met at, um, at um, Control Shift and through working with uh, a bookstore that no longer exists that has had hosted um, the Black aesthetic in the in the creation of, of new spaces such as Moments Bookstore, which um, was kind of uh, uh, the workers of the, the old bookstore reforming and kind of living and making our dreams possible. And um, I think a lot about that, like it feels so hard to have this collective, like collective spaces in a form that we know for them to sunset, um, like any ending, which is really hard. Um, and also like what it means to just say goodbye to that iteration so that other iterations can just become their, their more fuller selves. Um, and to kind of like be in this tangle of like all of our overlaps and also knowing that like, oh yeah, moments is like becoming its own thing and like, is ready to like host the new version of the black aesthetic and like ready to kind of like greet all these new um iterations of this like i don't know spreading out new 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 massaging of old muscles mm. yeah i really love this dis discussion of dispersal and um i recently was introduced to the story of Orisha Obatala, who's like the original Orisha, all, all Orisha within traditional Yoruba spirituality come from Obatala in some way, because he was a, like a vengeful servant, shattered Obatala into little bits and his body went all over the world and it was gathered back up, but not completely. And so the remaining bits of him of the Orisha uh, from which uh, or is from which from where other Orisha came from and then you know they're the spiritual dealing beings in uh in Yoruba spirituality and kind of thinking of this is as stop oh, sorry I have a cat and he's he's he wanted love okay um but uh thinking of this as like especially in conversation with uh with Lucasa's the visual aspect the design aspect kind of thinking of these connections um that are like I love the idea of just thinking of the energy that's out there that we can hold on to like the energy that Taylor you were able to to embody during No Neutral Alliance like I've, I've definitely had moments like that where I worked so hard and so long, and I'd have no idea where that energy came from, because right now I don't have it. Um, but it was part of like being in community with people and being connected um, in a lineage too. like having, okay, you're gonna have to go down. Um, sorry, he's cute, but um, okay, yeah, yeah, there we go. Okay. Um, uh, hmm. Yeah. Anyhow, I I just thinking of dispersal and the the origins of something like as beautiful as an Orisha, um, and then their lineage and continuing on because they are also embodied in us. Um, to think of, uh, I love thinking that in in communication with with what y'all are talking about. But um, I also want to encourage anyone in the audience. Um, I thought this would be about an hour. Uh, I know on the, the flyer it said an hour and a half. Uh, we still have a lot we can talk about um, and we can continue chatting along for, you know, another 20 minutes. But if anyone has any like questions, tangible, not tangible comments, feel free to, to jump in. Um, yeah.
but yes, well, but I don't think there's understand. a question in the Q and A, but I think we kind of already talked about it. Oh, I didn't see it. Um, You're kind of like always talking about that question. Your cat said he's loud. <laughs> um. Yes, that's my. Are you talking about like the what's next question? No, in the Q and A. Oh, I don't think I'm looking in the right spot. It's separate from the chat. I just found it myself. Oh, okay. Um, oh, Q&A. Can we talk about your work outside of institutions? Curious experience uh, with DIY spaces and the specific benefit challenges they've brought to your collect. Uh, I mean, yeah, I, I do feel like we talked about, I, I think we could dig a little bit more into the difficulty of collective work um because uh it's easy to romanticize sometimes uh, especially in opposition to the um to being isolated um but and as someone who came from a family of six kids working as collectives can be really hard um and sometimes can feel like it can cut deep uh but also can be very beautiful and fruitful um when when everything goes well yeah and when you go through challenges together, like I think something about collective work is if you're doing what uh, what y'all have been saying, you know, talking regularly, having a mediator come in, you're forced to deal with something that in other spaces might just linger um, and cause you to leave. But in order to like really be in community, you have to address these things. You have to uh, bring them to the fore and have the difficult conversations. Literally, it's in direct opposition of everything that is normal institutionally, is the work you have to do outside of the institution, which for certain things is easy, but other things it's really hard because when you work in those spaces, which are just super corporate, it's very passive aggressive, very hush, 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 very, you know, top down, um, your feelings, everything, you're not able to address how you feel until it bubbles over. Cause that's when it gets real. When you like, excuse me, excuse me, you're just not able to address how you feel until it reaches a peak because you can't do anything about it. Um, <coughs> excuse me. So I think that one sec. Okay. My bad, but yeah, it's just in direct opposition to that. No, definitely. Even just how HR is structured, like you, you need a certain amount of evidence for, you know, in order to bring something to the fore. Also, HR is not there for you. HR is there for the institution. Um, and it's more thinking of like legally, how can we protect this entity as opposed to holistically, how can we create a, a good, a, you know, healthy workspace for everyone? And um, yeah, which which does lead to things bubbling up until they're at the absolute worst. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think you have to kind of protect yourselves from the desires of, um, which can be your own desires and also can be desires of, of others to, to have a certain kind of recognition from institutions. Because I think that, especially in the Bay Area, which is an art market where there are fewer and fewer opportunities that can be given to you, there can be the potential for competition or desires for recognition. And I think that that becomes something that you have to be honest about it. You have to. You have to. You have to struggle against is the kind of ways that um, this place makes you suffer <laughs> in a certain way because of the lack of resources. And what are you going to do with that? Like, how are you going to still be in community when you need to support yourself and and, and your family or those around you? So I think that that's something that you have to look to to wait to models for doing that. Like I'm thinking about. Um, Lucasa and moments and thinking about mutual aid. I'm thinking about the fact that there were these DIY spaces like the bookstore, like Milk Art, where we could um, where we could actually make things happen um, without necessarily having to like look to be published have that work published in art form like you know what I'm saying like it would might be nice but but you know what I'm saying but that wasn't that didn't necessarily happen 
Um, we have to archive that ourselves. And I don't know, like the work was really, it was really beautiful looking at the work because I'm thinking of those, I'm looking at those sheets and I'm thinking about like being in the cold in the bay in the backyard, like covering ourselves with blankets and coats, like to watch a movie together. Like that was like a really beautiful moment. So, yeah. Mm. That's so real. Like, what are your own desires? And I think that's such a challenge. Um, and what happens, yeah, like your desires, what's available, what do you have, checking yourself, knowing when to turn things down, you know, like this sort of like constant struggle um, can be really, really difficult. And I think going back to what you were saying earlier, Jamal, about like the planning and having that time with your collective to figure out what is, why, what are we doing? What are our, what are, what's going on here? Like, who are we? And then when it comes to that point, then you're able to really be like, okay, y'all, what are, what are we willing to sacrifice? <laughs> like really for real, for real, like what are we willing to sacrifice and who are we? Or if we do decide to do something and take some sort of something or whatever, we got to do it with our whole chest. You know what I mean? Um, yeah, because I think that's something that I struggle with a lot. Because when I first started, no neutral, like when no neutral lines have first started, I was real militant it was like you're here or you're here and I think that that was really important for the work in the time being that it's done like I think that it was actually super important and it wouldn't have been able to sort of like work the way that it did if my brain wasn't there I think now I've softened quite a bit and I'm <laughs> now kind of thinking about okay like there's all this liminal space how do you move within this liminal space Jamal's point you right it's not a lot of resources here in the Bay Area um yeah so it's interesting mm, I also I, I keep coming back to just thinking about like in so many of these like collective spaces that I've been in it's like it's with our friends you know like it's like our people are who feed us and um almost like you know make us want to stay in long ass collective meetings that go on all night and cold warehouses like it doesn't matter because they're with our friends um I mean it does matter but you know um like what what are those those moments that like our friends remind us to stop and just like instead of going over the agenda like we're just gonna like check in with how our hearts are today or like what we're able to be present with and I feel like those are the moments or that's what I've been kind of like practicing these days with moments, um, cooperative bookstore and, and collective space is like, okay, this is like, we decided to like open this space together and it doesn't mean that we're gonna lose our ourselves and it doesn't mean that we're gonna lose our friendships. Um, and um, even though the day-to-day -day work and the like, the nitty gritty feels like tricky and hard. Sometimes it's like, oh wait, when it feels hard, let's just like come back and like see how we're doing um, and, and like remember why we even wanted to start a space like this. Um, and like, that's really what matters. Like our, our, our people, our people work must be strong. Like our links and our nodes between our people have to be strong for us to even want to do this tricky work. I think that's a really important part of collective work that is in opposition to, to these museum spaces is being able to check in with one another and really being there caring like in your heart for not just like the professional lives of everyone involved in a collective, but the, for the personal lives. You know, you these are our friends. These are um, family in many ways, um, and so you you're aware of what's happening. You're aware if someone is you know having difficulty finding housing, or if they you know need food at this meeting, um, or if a mom or you know relative is not doing well. And so instead of just going business as usual, it's an, it's you know, part of second nature almost to check in and make sure that everyone is also able to be present. 
Um, and I, I found in some spaces where that, that doesn't happen, a lot of damage can be done, um, where the, you know, the end point, the by the product of the collective is, is prioritized more. Um, sometimes that can, that can lead to a lot of damage. So being in, in safe spaces where you're able to like come undone a little bit because the whole point of us being in community is that we're we had to find spaces to combat a really uh, oppressive world um, and a really um, damaging space. So we're all a little damaged a little bit. And so we need to take care of each other. Um, and and we need to damage those institutions back. Now we, that's, see, that's the thing is I, you know, we're, we're dismantling the master's house. And so we're, we're trying to find those tools that are not, you know, that are not the master's tools to dismantle them. Um, I, I think about that a lot in collective space and, and of Audre Lorde's, you can't dismantle the master's house with the master's tools. And um, I, I love to think, like a Toy and Oji Odotola once said that the art world is kind of like a, a coliseum and there's this big spotlight at the center and everyone is climbing over each other to get to the center and be in the spotlight. And she just wants to turn the light off so that our eyes can adjust to darkness. And I love the idea of us adjusting to darkness and then gathering and creating fire and creating our own natural light. Like these, these spaces are more, you know, more uh, healing spaces and warm spaces and they're not as big and they're not as bright. And they're not as loud as that original light. Um, but these little side, you know, like, a you know, Jam just had a big exhibition at MoMA. Like that was a, a small a campfire that was built at one point and now it's been a part of a larger spotlight um but the uh but I, I love thinking of collectives as and as fire as that tool um that dismantles the master's home eventually but it already is just as in its existence hmm <sighs> Well, let's, we have like seven minutes left in in this. I wonder if there's anything that y'all want to uh, break up in particular, um, want to emphasize anything we haven't talked about yet that you're like, ooh, I wanted to say this tonight. Um, and then again, inviting the audience, any questions, any comments at all, feel free to drop them in the chat, both the Q&A that we now know exists and the webinar chat. Yeah, I'm just glad that y'all are here. I'm glad that we had get to have this talk. Um, I am also intrigued by what the digital, you know, space can do for permitting collectives to continue. Like, as Jamal said, like with the Black aesthetic, people being in different spaces, what how has technology allowed for us to kind of be in communion, community still, um, and being connected still. So I'm grateful that while the four of us are in different spaces that we're able to be here tonight. Yeah, it feels like a treat to just see y'all's faces. Um, and just, yeah, I'm, I'm just thinking about like, you know, so much of No Neutral's work was over Zoom, you know, because it was the pandemic and it was like, um, we were all, in Oakland mostly or the or the Bay Area, but it was like, you know, so much of our, yeah, organizing was in was in this form. And um I mean, yeah, just this this kind of like added layer of all, all these way all these all these tables that we now get to be at um and conversations and and people that get to be here tonight that aren't in the Bay or aren't in where we're located too. Um and that being like this other this like web expansion, um, not only for, for safety and, and survival, but also just like, how can it get a little bit bigger when we thought it couldn't? Yeah, Zoom was a huge resource. Um, <laughs> Google Docs was in there together. That website money somebody sent website, us. Just people reaching out. I think we were talking 
about like what are different ways that we don't necessarily have to sort of like rely on the like I guess institutions or cer certain spaces for many and that communal care is so rich and so important um and I think like for NNA like we were able to operate like how was it sustainable like we were able to get donations from people like we were able to get money to like support us in a time where everything was up in the air because also too like collectively aside from this work I remember we talking to like folks like okay like you signed up for that um unemployment like did you do this like there's resources uh -huh. to work through that like what what's what are your plans for this what's going on here so I think that that was also really important too because it was just a time of uncertainty and uh, no one really knew sort of like what their trajectory was going to look like um especially like just working in the arts so I think that it served sort of like multiple purposes for sure and we're all kind of like precarious collective members that was like a sweet moment to be like oh we can like come to our meeting and like go through the agenda and also be like we all like need help yeah. we all like don't know how to pay the rent where our collective space is like what do we all do how can we like split up this money that's being donated yeah. to not only go to NNA but also go towards the like aid and support of these other other collectives mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that that is a, a really particular, like a really important uh, point and a really important ongoing question of how like we support one another and also the kind of support that we get or can take. Because I think that also like the No Neutral Alliance and the Black Aesthetic were organizing online during this moment of crisis as you brought up, which also led to an influx of resources in a really particular moment. Yep. And those resources are actually still around, surprisingly. Like, I mean, like they, like some of them have like lasted. So it's been like a really interesting thing because the Black Aesthetic never had resources before. Like we didn't have like an account necessarily that we could pull from continually um, in that way. Um, so that's a really like that's a really interesting thing to to think about is the ways that we're able to like support ourselves or keep this work going outside of like an institutional context. Mm -hmm. And I would like to say, you know, for the audience, et cetera, like support <laughs> like collectives like that are doing the work outside of the institution in order to make the change, some of the changes that you may want to see. That might be another avenue to think about. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah. And I think I can't like the thing that I, I, I wanted to say, like, um, when I came here was that I think that I would like to encourage others to do the work that we're doing, like that collective work to think about if you're isolated, if you're in your office, if you're um, an artist who doesn't feel like they're getting that kind of support that they need, that I think that it is worth taking the time to, to do that, to do that struggle, to do that work, to mm -hmm. do the long meetings, to, you know, make the Instagram accounts, send out the MailChimp, et cetera. Like, I think all of that work is really, is really important. So I think that I, I just encourage folks to do that. Um, yeah. yeah. And I feel like that also like in doing that work, I think it starts well beyond the formation of the thing. Like I was like cross paths with Jamal at SF MoMA at certain points and then Lucasa, you know, just being around and you just meet people through different avenues. And I think that part of that work is those just day-to-day -day interactions and you never know who's going to show up for you when the time is like come because you tune day um shout out to your tune day whose work is in the show um they're an incredible artist and really just like a co-conspirator but I had we had met in passing a couple times you know what I mean like I admire work and all of a sudden I'm right I'm rubbing shoulders next to you in a google doc and we're just like find out that we work really well together who would have thought but that's only because of that like community building over time and then when you really need it you're like oh okay like here we go and i think that's what's really beautiful too awesome well it is um 7 30 pacific time 10 30 eastern time um 
so I, I think it's time to close. Just want to be mindful of everyone's time. Um, thank you guys so much for, for being here tonight, for having this conversation. Um, and I hope we can continue to have many more. Um, for everyone in the audience, again, if you haven't seen the show, it's up until November 27th, which is the Sunday after Thanksgiving. Um, so please uh, go up and check out the show. And uh, everyone, I guess, have a wonderful evening. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Luchi. This is wonderful. Such a treat to be here. Yeah. Right. Awesome. Okay. Bye, y'all. Bye. Bye. Bye.